All right, there we go. Um, so hi everyone, my name is uh, Julio. I'm a co-founder at Fractal, where I lead product and engineering. And um, I'm very excited to be here, and I, I'm really looking forward to telling you about um, what we do. Um, but before I get started, there is something that I need to share. Um, and uh, both for context and awareness, but also like, you know, to, to contextualize the perspective to which I come to this and to which Fractal comes to its suite of products that it offers right now. And that is, um, the state of identity in Web3 is appalling right now, and we need to stop fucking around with identity. We need, thank you. <laughs> um, we need to tune out the identity maximalists, and we need to stop waiting for perfect solutions. Because we're not gonna get anywhere like that. How much longer are we gonna be sitting around polishing standards? How much longer are we going to like pretend we're Web3 and tell our users to go and feed their data to walled gardens, to strip naked in front of some corporate that gives no shits about them? That's us today. And um, it's not like we don't have the technology. Uh, the, I mean, the Internet Identity Workshop, God bless them, they've, got, they've been at this for 15 years, since 2005. Well, my math is off, but you get it. The W3C for almost a decade. And that is amazing work, and what have we all done with that? Well, we've raised hundreds of millions as an industry. We built a bunch of decentralized identity protocols who are now extremely expensive deserts with no function because there are no users. So we've got all this amazing infrastructure for marketplaces to develop, an identity to be self-sovereign, and it's all perfect, but they're empty. And why? Why are they deserts? And they're deserts because identity is messy. Identity verification is messy. Compliance is messy. Supporting users is messy. So nobody wants to take responsibility. But Fractal does. We embrace this mess. We take this responsibility. And for those of, us that, those of you that, that don't know us, like, um, well, I suppose this is what we look like now. And um, uh, we've been verifying identities for crypto companies for five years. That's, that's all we do. That's all we've been doing since the beginning. And uh, we learned a lot in this process. Um, and first of all, we learned not to be identity maximalists. We, we learned that identity is not like something fun or something you know, extremely pure and very, very easy to systematize and code. No, identity is messy. Identity is about building bridges to meet space, to real humans. And that's the messiest thing that there is. So like, you know, instead of waiting and masturbating over like how exactly you're supposed to implement the DID standard, we built. And we built, and now we've got a million users. We are not a desert. We're the only non-desert, in fact. And we did this because we have a pragmatic approach. Um, like, is, are we completely decentralized? No. Are our products perfect? Also no. But we're live. Are our products run the, the spectrum, depending on your tech stack, your ethos? Where are you in the decentralization process? And because we did this, we now built the community that we did. And my point that I wanna, the point that I wanna make, and I promise like, I'll stop ranting in a second, is that, is this. Um, crypto needs to grow up, and it needs to grow, period. Uh, we need adoption. And we need, it is our responsibility to make it grow well. And so, for me, identity brings much needed legitimacy. Identity, making it simple and secure, is how we onboard the next billion people into crypto. And don't, don't get me wrong, I am not talking about identity as opposed to anonymity. Those are not in conflict. Identity is a feature. We have so much work in blockchains targeted towards anonymity, thankfully. Who is thinking of the other side? Who is thinking of what identity enables? Who is thinking of identity as human uniqueness for proper democratic governance with one token, one vote? Sorry, with one human, one vote instead of having the plutocracy of one token and one vote. Who's thinking about fair airdrops? Who's thinking about authentic NFTs? Identity is literally civil resistance. And um, I'm really sorry, but it, like, if, you, if you don't get it, or if you won't get it, you're not gonna make it. It is a very, very powerful feature that will help us bring the next billion folks. And I know 
you know, why we keep using the tools that we do, because, you know, we're all working very hard in our core products. We're all focusing on what we're trying to bring to market, and identity is often an afterthought. And your users hate you for that, <laughs> because what you're telling me to do, telling them to do, absolutely sucks. And we can do better today. We're going to be in a much better position in 10 years, but we're in a much better position today, and we're not leveraging that. And that is a bit of a shame. And I want to show you what I mean. Um, but I'm also kind of like calling on you to revisit how you're thinking about this and what you're waiting for before helping us push towards a world of more decentralized identity, more self-sovereign identity, where folks actually are in control. The right side of the spectrum I showed you before. So let me show you what I mean. Um, I just felt like I really need to give you some context. Now, who are we? We're the market leader for IDV in crypto. That's all we've been doing. We are not a technology company. I mean, I guess we are, but like, that is not how we think of ourselves. We think of ourselves as like, identity verification is important. It is critical. Often folks have no choice to do it. And well, we also think that it sucks. So we wanted to make it better since the beginning. And that's what we've been working on. And in the process, we also discovered that, you know, what was the very beginning just really about KYC AML, because it was, it was what we were doing, is actually a much bigger problem and has much bigger utility in crypto. Because in crypto, we're just addresses. But humanity is how we coordinate. What makes us different is that we started from the identity verification part, and we found a way to bring that to Web3 applications. We Essentially, after putting together a bunch of very, very pretty proofs of concept, implementing the W3C standards, working with ERC-75 and 735, and nobody giving a shit, we instead found a way that folks can progress in that direction without having to completely change the way that they're doing their business. Because identity in crypto is a lot more than just KYC AML. I was telling you before, it's about fair governance, it's about fair airdrops, it's about enable under collateralizing, un enabling under-collateralized loans. It's about actually bringing the people to crypto that need to be in crypto and whose identity is necessary to unlock what they want to unlock. So the way that we approach this is we're, it's a very pragmatic perspective. On, on the left side, that's how we started. We, started. we were a federated identity provider. Think login with Facebook, but then on the other side, instead of having, I don't know, some, some random information about a person, you got verified information. People just log in, then you can do a simple standard OAuth process, which every web developer knows. And this has worked for a very, very long time. And this is all that people wanted. And we wanted to push them towards, well, <laughs> using a data wallet. It's on the very right side of the spectrum. We've got one built. Our users that use the data wallet get their credentials in their wallet. They can, <laughs> they can create um, proofs from that information with selective disclosure to only share really, really what they need. And whomever is verifying still knows that it was us. Do you know how many people use that? 50,000. It's ridiculous. We're not there yet. We're not ready for that yet, apparently. We have the product. We'll maintain it. We'll make it work. We'll keep trying to push people. But what, what they want to end up with infrequently is the stuff in the middle. And that is because as more and more people build infrastructure in Web3 and more and more of your backends migrate to Web3, then it starts becoming extremely clunky to try and make a Web2 protocol like OAuth work with that. So how does your smart contract do OAuth? Well, it doesn't. So instead of trying to like jump from the very left to the very right, we have a pragmatic continuum, a pragmatic spectrum of decentralization, and we try to push people as far to the right as they are comfortable going as their processes allow them to go and as their tech stack allows them to go. And this is a very straightforward um, illustration of how our OAuth API works. Everybody knows federated identity. You're like, oh, log in with Fractal, get verified with Fractal or something. Talks about QIC, that's all we did in the beginning. And so user comes back to the website and you're like, great, okay, so the, your website now knows that this person, you're selling a token, for example, you can do business with them. How does your smart contract know that? And like the collection of weird clutches and hacks that like folks that our partners, our clients put together to make this work is insane. Um, and um, I mean, I, I've done that before. I've ran a token sale and I had to pay six grand to like whitelist the people that could buy it inside of my smart contract. This is absurd. This doesn't make any sense, but it's straightforward. People understand it, people use it. Everybody that has used the web knows what this is, but this is incomplete. 
And so we want to bridge the gap and make this more available for Web3. And we put together something called the Credential API. These are not W3C verifiable credentials, not because I have a problem with them, quite the opposite, I think that they're amazing. This is getting stuff to production quickly and getting stuff that works today quickly. So any user will connect your wallet or connect their wallet to your platform, to your DAP, and you can immediately talk to us and say, hey, so you ask the user to sign a message giving you consent to ask if they're with Fractal, if we verify them already, if we verify them to the criteria that you need, a certain level of KYC or simply being a unique person. And you get back a proof that you can send in their transactions to the smart contract so that your smart contract can always know, should I accept this transaction or not? Your front end can immediately respond by looking at the status that this person has in Fractal. And because we have built it as a community and not a transactional service of identity verification, your chances are going to be pretty high because we've got a million users and about half of them are fully verified. And the way that it works is super simple. Like you, a user connects the wallet, you ask them to, send, to, to sign a message so that we know that they're okay. Uh, sharing information with you. And it's very limited information. You essentially just know that they passed a certain KYC level or that they're a unique person or they're an accredited investor and they don't live in a country that you can't do business with for some reason. All of this happens with the user's consent. None of this is on chain. Now, we have a different approach that some folks have been preferring lately uh, and, you know, it's all full of trade-offs, but it's a DID registry. Are these W3C DIDs? No. Why? Do I have a problem with them? No. But this is in production. And the way that this works is instead of you having to ask the user to sign a message, send it to us, we simply whitelist their address on chain once for everybody. So if you are on boards to adapt, like they will connect their MetaMask, you can immediately look up the registry, and then if a user onboards to a DAP, then they're there ready for every other DAP. If your DAO wants to do one person, one vote, they look the user up in the registry, or somebody already put them there, great, awesome, I can do business with this person. Or if your application is selling securities and it needs the user to be an accredited investor, any application requiring that before, the user's now in the registry. This becomes a public good for any DAP building on this ecosystem because it keeps growing and growing and growing with more and more addresses that you're going to have to deal with without really telling you the name of this person or anything about this person. If your, compliance, if your use case is compliance, there's a few asterisks here in which you've got other rails that you're able to use to pull any information for audits that you need. But this is not gonna be on-chain, it's just not gonna be available. The point is the fact that you can do business with this user is available on chain and everybody can launch and read it today. It's there. And um, I don't wanna go too deep into this, but this is something that we want to replicate all over. We want to make sure that this is available on every chain so that wherever you're building your DAP, doesn't matter what a user used first. If they have, they're there, ready for you, ready for your token, a click away. And the Fractal Wallet is a simple credential wallet. I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with this. Um, it is a, uh, essentially a signed piece of JSON that you can then use to create subproofs from the data, so telling somebody you're over 18 rather than telling them your actual age. And this, this I love. This, I think, is where we're all gonna get to at some point. But until we do, I really believe in having intermediary solutions that we can use today. And the way that this works is exactly as you'd expect a uh, wallet to work. Like, you know, you've got a website saying, hey, we need this information from you. Do you want to share it? Do you not? We don't know about it. We're, we're not intermediating this. We verify this user once. Like, we don't know they're sharing this information with anybody else. We shouldn't. It's none of our business. And they should be carrying it with them. They should not be living in a hot server somewhere. So I think that... Um, my whole point is primarily, we're all dreaming about how identity could be done in this new world of Web3, and we're all building for a future that is going to be here in 10 years. And if our plan is until then to keep using the same shitty solutions that we use today, we should really not be doing that, and we should iterate towards it, and we can help you iterate, to, iterate towards it because we have functioning solutions in production that are much better than anything that you can use if you, the privacy of your users is important and if the us usability of your users is important and if you don't want them to do the same thing over 
and over and over again. This is open. You don't need to call sales. You can just go to fractal.id, set yourself up. It will work. Try it out. Complain about what you don't like. Let me know. And I'll, we'll figure it out for you. But please, try it out because you can and you don't need to pay. That's it. Thank you, folks. Let's make this a bit better. Hi, thank you. Uh, the, the one thing I can't figure out with ID is at some point there's somebody that has a copy of my identity or a video of the agent I verified with or whatever. It's in some database, right, which is off-chain. And doesn't that become a massive honeypot? Like in that case, are you the entity where my real name and my real ID is in some centralized database on AWS or whatever? And yeah, it's, it's turtles all the way down, right? Yeah. Like how how can we ever make that work that it's that everyone feels safe using it? So um, I lead technology at Fractal, and I need to be able to sleep at night. And uh, having hundreds of thousands of passports in a database connected to the web, as we do. You know, I sleep well at night because I know the team that I have and I know what we built, but like, no, that should not be a thing. That is a gigantic honeypot. That is why we want to move to the right. If you use the fractal wallet, your data is no longer online. It doesn't have to. If you are not doing a compliance use case, your, date doesn't, your data does not need to be stored even. Because the only circumstance in which we need to store your data, if you're using your fractal wallet, is because AML regulation mandates that you as a relying party need to have access to this information, and we tell our clients, please, this is not your core business. This is not what we do. Let us host that. Don't pull it. Don't pull it. Don't ask us for it. We'll put that offline. And then if you have an issue, we will bring that back online for you. It's not like it, instead of growing a honeypot because it's connected to the internet and can be attackable, we move data offline so that it can be properly protected. And to serve the, um, the credentials API, we can't do that. These credentials API that we do, I mean, they last for 24 hours. There's a bunch of reasons for that. I could go into that. We need to have that data online. But we only need to have the minimum set that allows us to tell you, yep, this address that you're asking about indeed matches the requirements that you have. We don't need to have this person's name online. We don't need to be contributing to a honeypot. And the further right we go, the zero or that honeypot becomes. I don't know if this answers your question, but it's kind of how I see it. it. It does. The question then becomes, if you no longer have the identities, will the government still trust your mechanism? Yes, because we will have the identities. They're just not online. Then, then I must, where, where are they going to be? Well, they're going to be encrypted at rest. They are encrypted at rest. And sure, you always have the $5 wrench attack, uh, but um, they are not in a database that you can just throw your automated scripts and your other teams to try and take it down, to try and get access to it. It is not something that can be, that can suffer a massive breach unless, you know, yeah, the $5 wrench attack on all of the people that would need the keys from to open this, unlock this data. Thank you. It's much harder. Nice Thank shirt. You. Yes. <laughs> Hello. So thanks for the presentation. Yes. Lovely to hear more people, you know, care about this. And we all need to do this. So um, just one short thing. I would like to understand a bit more about, you know, what the actual proof is of, you know, like the verified user and, you know, how, where this lives and what is it? I mean, um, what, what kind of data is that? So you mean the process that the user follows for us to be able to verify their identity? Yep. It depends on requirements. So to tell human uniqueness, uh, we do something called liveness detection. So you look at a camera for two seconds. Uh, we, we don't have that video. We have like um, a signature produced from that video that then allows us to know if you do it again, are you the same person or not? So that's what we store, uh, and that allows us to deduplicate you. And for uniqueness use cases, for say one person, one vote use case, that's all you need to do. For fair airdrops to happen, that's all you need to do. 
Um, if you're a compliance case, or if you have a compliance use case, and you actually need to provide a lot more information than that, well, you provide a lot more information than that. We take your identity document and we analyze it. We take your proof of address and we analyze it. If we're talking about investor accreditation, we take, for example, your source of wealth documents and we analyze it. But we don't capture this from everyone. We capture this from the people that actually need to provide the information to unlock a service. I am not a fan of KYC AML. I understand the reason it's there. I think it's a very, very bad tool for what we're trying to achieve, and it's throwing sand in our eyes, but it's how we have to do things. We don't really have a choice. So I'm not doing this because I think, well, this is amazing, and everybody should require compliance for you to upvote and downvote. No, but people do require compliance, and they should be able to do this in the way that affects the people the least. Nobody comes to us because they're like, oh man, it'd be great to share your passport, my passport with you. No, it's something they have to do. So how can we make this happen in a way that annoys the users the least, so that protects their privacy the most? And so we ask only what we need to ask based on the compliance requirements of whomever is looking for this user. Yes. So, how, how do you do that? How do you achieve it? So, uh, that's done using uh, selective disclosure on the fractal wallet. It's, um, I can't tell you the mechanics of how that works exactly, but you essentially take some basic information that is signed itself. So, your date of birth is signed, and you can use your knowledge predicates to derive uh, a very basic, you know, greater than function that you can also prove that it is signed by fractal, or it's based on data that was signed by fractal before. Does that answer your question? Yes. All right. We have a final question here as well. <laughs> yes, with the fractal wallet, that's how it works. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Julio. This is a great presentation. Uh, I'm just curious. I'm asking this for a friend who are from Australia who is uh, not unable to attend the meeting, but he asked me to ask this anyway. Uh, out of the one million users, I mean, uh, what kind of use cases are they really using your wallet to do? Because it's pretty Where impressive. Are using Fractal 4? Yeah, because you have pretty impressive 500,000 verifiable uh, credentials. And then the, maybe the second question followed that is how can you scale up from this 1 million to the next 10 billion, whatever? So, it is. well, I mean. Thank you. 10 billion would mean we're doing a poor job because there's not 10 billion unique individuals, but I get your question. Um, and the, the user base that we grew came primarily from a KYC AML compliance use case. That's what we started by doing. That's the whole reason we created the company was to make that process better. So that user base grew for that use case, a client wants to run a token sale, somebody wants to sell securities, or somebody wants to have a system in which like, you have a collection of unique accredited investors. This is always what we've served. And then in pushing towards Web3, we inevitably came to contact with new pain points in Web3. So I think that growth is not really going to come from there going forward. I think growth is going to come from people understanding that they can now make use of human uniqueness as a way to build fair communities and to properly reward your community for the grassroots evangelism that you get, for the effort that you get, for product, for contributions of any kind in your DAO. And for that, you will not necessarily need to know the country that a user is based on, but you certainly don't want to drop the same airdrop to 10 addresses if they're the same person. So this use case of uniqueness, which is also the simplest one, the most private one, the one that requires the least information, I think is how things are going to grow. And as regulation comes closer and closer to crypto, and it will, and it is already happening, and you've heard of the travel rules, and like more and more folks, well, are going to have to bump up that um, human uniqueness, say, verification that they did in order to now have access to something that is clamped down by the law. And so uh, I think that uniqueness is the gateway because crypto is about coordination and we're missing that layer. We're missing the real way how we coordinate, which is human beings. Um, and I think that that's what unlocks the gates. Um, I think inevitably, Sadly or not, depends on, I mean, I think it is, um, it is going to have to be denser than that. Uh, and in five years, we're going to be seeing a lot of more platforms having to require a certain amount of due diligence, which doesn't identify you on chain, but it means that you need it to identify with someone. Thank you, Julio. Thank you, folks. <laughs>